<laughs> and, uh, not gonna lie, guys, the future's looking bleak. <laughs> It's yeah, not it's looking a, good for us. Buy your magnums and enjoy the grass while you can because it's gonna be a hot summer. <laughs> and welcome back to No Books on a Dead Planet. This is a kind of book club, but there's not a book club. You're allowed to come if you haven't read the book. You're allowed to come if you intend to read the book because we're going to leave some of the spoilers out. Uh, I basically created this book club-ish thing um, because I've realised that I'm really struggling to envision what a lot of climate research is calling the end of the world. Doesn't compute, cannot engage, absolute shutdown in my brain. However, No Books on a Planet... Um, that seems like an emergency to me. Um, so I've been inviting really cool people onto the channel uh, to force me to read some of the climate books that I am scared to read. And today we are welcoming none other than Jack Edwards. Hello. OMFG. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Oh, this is my favourite channel on YouTube.com, so I'm buzzing. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's going to be my quote on my banner now. Yeah, <laughs> my absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Jack decided to read Parable of the Sower together by Ota Octavia E. Butler. Jack's a nerd and he has the actual book. I listen to the e-book because I'm lazy. <laughs> So I don't have anything uh, to show you, but just picture it. It's right here. I'll hold it. I'll hold it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hold it for both of us. I will mark um, your glamorous assistant over here. <laughs> I know. I'm also very intimidated. Can you just show the side of your book, please, Jack? That is a lot of tabs. I did tab it. This, <laughs> this it. is the book of a man who has recently graduated from university and still remembers how to be able to club about books. <laughs> I know. Let it go, Jack. They're just books. Yeah. Nothing means anything anymore. Life is pain. The curtains are just blue because the curtains are blue. <laughs> exactly. Oh my god. There's no deeper meaning. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh god, don't even remind me. I'm having flashbacks already. Um, but yeah, so so we're going to chat about this book and also just about a bit about our feelings about reading and the climate in general. Um, so if you want to listen along, please do get a cuppa, sit down. We're going to have a proper little natter. Now, Jack, when I invited you on the channel, I gave you a long list of books that I would like to read about the climate, my to-do list. Yes. And you picked this one. I want to hear why. Was there any reason or were the, were the curtains just blue? Well, mm, the curtains might have looked a bit like this. I like, well, <laughs> firstly, for me... I find that fiction is my ultimate gateway into understanding the world mm. and things that I may be normally shy away from and that I find a little bit intimidating. And so when you send me a list of lots of amazing sounding nonfiction and fiction, this is what kind of drew me in. Um, it's also a sort of dystopia, which is something that I quite enjoy. So it was a bit up my street and then it was also about um, the climate crisis. And so I thought, what a perfect way to learn some more about it and see what someone yeah. thought could happen. I definitely think there's more climate fiction emerging now. Yeah. But I think when Octavia, I'm going to I'm going to call her Octavia because I feel like we're friends. It's fine. Yeah. When Octavia released this in like 1993, I think it was, mm -hmm. or like 94, yeah. there wasn't that much climate fiction around. So I think that's really interesting itself. It's a bit of a, like a historical artifact that's like, yeah. oh, Climate fiction before it was cool. <laughs> exactly, and it's the kind of book that you read and you can't believe that it was written that long ago because it feels like it could have been written and published this year. Yeah. And it would still be a sort of dystopia anyway. Yeah. Even though it's written, I think it's set in about 2027. Um, and that isn't that long away. <laughs> it actually, I, I was looking at this, back at this because I couldn't remember. It actually starts in 2024. Four, yes. Which is a mere 18 months away. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And not gonna lie, guys, the future's looking bleak. It's yeah, not it's looking a, good for us. Buy your magnums and enjoy the grass while you can because it's gonna be a hot summer. When you when you say magnums, do you mean the cider or the um, the ice lolly or both? Why limit yourself? Both. The yeah. world's on fire. <laughs> yeah. Let's party. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this book, um, if just to give you a little brief, if no, if you haven't read it, yes. um, it follows Lauren, who is um, fifteen at the beginning of the book, eighteen when the book ends, which is very important if you know what happens. It's, it's incredibly important that she is actually at the age of consent towards the end, yes. um, and she is uh, a hyper. Uh, she's got hyper empathy, which is actually a thing that somebody in another book in another episode of this series has in We Were Wolves. Well, once there are wolves, that main character also has hyper empathy. So I think it's oh, interesting, interesting that that's like a choice that climate fiction writers have is to like give yeah. this one main character like something that's like a little bit more of an empathy superpower. Yeah. Um, and basically she lives in a compound 
um, in this future that is actually our present where because of the climate and also because of lots of economic reasons, I think, as well. It seems you never get an actual story of why the world has broken down, but it's clear that mm. it has. <laughs> it's apparent that it has. <laughs> Immediately <laughs> it's apparent very, that it has. The, the nervous <laughs> laughter is because I think, for, I don't know about you, Jet, but I found this a comple- completely harrowing book to read. Yes, I don't think I'm the same person anymore <laughs> after okay, reading this. I mean, that's bold but i i don't i'm not surprised um but yeah she's part of the middle class so they live in a compound um correct me if by the way at any point if you think that i'm saying this wrong she lives in a compound she's in the middle classes Lo- the majority of people live outside of compounds with no access to water or, or or electricity or anything and they're basically just kind of living off their own backs stealing um lots of like horrific stuff is happening on the outside basically and then a select few obviously have all the control of all the electricity all the water living it up in gold palaces yeah. a classic <laughs> um, so she was like born a Baptist but she actually has re- renounces God at the beginning of the book and feels like she is creating although she des- she describes it as discovering a, a religion yes but <laughs> which again I was like um, Lauren talk me through that please yeah. <laughs> um, but, but she's creating a religion called Earthseed and she's written, writing a book about it called Earthseed the book of the living mm-hmm. um so it's a, it's a very strange premise. Was it when you started the book? Was it what you were expecting? Were you a bit like, oh? Yeah. Do you know what I found really interesting about this in terms of it being a dystopia is that often a lot of the dystopias that I've read are about a world with something heightened. So like with heightened surveillance, with heightened um, censorship, things like that. This is a dystopia about a world without it's about a world that has Mm. been so finite that we are actually running out of things um and so it's essentially stripping back what we currently have rather than kind of adding new rules to the world um i thought it was really interesting that it's kind of like a world that is so desolate and kind of empty we've the electricity is running low that water is running low and it's sort of about how humans would respond to that and surprise they don't respond well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't end well for most of the humans. Yeah, yeah, and there's also the most stressful part is that there's this this drug going around called pyro yeah. that basically when you take it, it makes you want to set things on fire. So that obviously adds an extra layer of stress for the community. Yes. Lauren is black, but she lives in a, a rare compound community that is like multiracial and, and really mm-hmm. diverse, but that doesn't seem to be apparent on the outside. So I, I and I know that like... um. Um, Octavia Butler was like at college during the Black Power movement and stuff so I'm Mm. sure that there's lots of parallels there about kind of racial segregation and her idea of something that is integrated but Mm. ultimately um, is quite fractured at the same time it's it's really interesting it's interesting in this book they often resort to having walls around communities Mm. and isolating certain groups and and yeah like you said the segregation is is huge um so it is interesting how these things do seem to crop up in a lot of dystopias because it is weirdly the way that humans seem to react to things that they don't understand Mm. is to kind of block it off block it away um and that does happen in here too (laughs) yeah it's it's weird as well because i i know that so much of it is based on reality yeah but i also want to think like oh would we really respond that way because in some ways the response say to the pandemic was really great and a lot of people actually banded together and were a lot more selfless Mm. and there's this book called hope in the dark by rebecca solnit that is like going through all of the historical moments like examples of when actually when there's war and scarcity like people tend to club together they don't tend to eat each other immediately (laughs) Yeah. but I think there's a lot of that as well so it's like weird for me to be like okay this is possible and people would be driven to that and ultimately yeah. it's, it is an exaggeration of a world we already live in it does sort of descend into <laughs> chaos and anarchy but it's it's interesting because it initially starts out as quite, quite a small group who are doing it people living on the outside um, of society are the ones who sort of start with the um, the crime and kind of scavenging people's houses and stuff and then it does eventually become the only way to survive because people start doing that so it does sort of it starts with a small group and then it does expand outwards so you can see how it it's not like oh it just happened overnight that we all just became savages and we just were like yeah. being awful to each other and killing each other eating each other it sort of happens like weirdly over time where mm. would you place this in terms of other books that you've read because i sort of my brain went sort of i would put it in the same category as something like the handmaid's tale perhaps 
Yeah, or Station Eleven or right. something like that that has like kind of like um, desert like environment where mm. there's one main character trying to survive and you're following them as they yes. either yeah. ascend or descend into <laughs> madness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd probably put it there, but I honestly thought um, it was a lot more sparse in the way the world was created. So it's yeah. hard. Like it, I don't know if that made that more scary because in like Station Eleven and, and like Handmaid's Tale, you do get an idea of what else is going on in the world and like True. you can picture more. But with her, maybe because she's fifteen as well, she's just kind of wandering mm. around the world like this, and you don't know what's going to come <laughs> at you I'm... next because she's only yeah. describing what's happening to her. And I yeah. found that even more stressful than I found it more stressful than Handmaid's Tale. Yes, because there was there was no perception of what was happening to everyone else. It was very much this is what's happening to my community, and it's terrifying. Mm. Um, and she sort of then ends up having living life on the road, um, and she is so young as well. I know, and and also like it's it's unclear like maybe I'm just like a selfish Brit but I'm like okay but what's happening in Britain is this happening in Britain right now or is this just an American thing that's going yeah, on yeah like a week stro- <laughs> what's going to happen with, to us is Europe okay <laughs> yeah should I start preparing like the bunker now Octavia like Octavia what's going to happen to me <laughs> yeah I'm like but am I getting a grab bag yeah it's not good yeah. for Lauren so <laughs> yeah it's interesting and I think as well like um, I it, the, the right I was wondering when I was reading it I was like what would this be like if it was told in third person because it's told in first person so you're only really getting her descriptors of stuff mm. and like it's some of it the language is quite sparse but I can tell from the writing that Octavia Butler's an incredible writer so I'm like oh I wonder if she and I don't know I, this is my first Octavia Butler book I don't know but yeah me too. she might have written stuff in third person or, or in other ways that I might enjoy more because in some ways like I don't know if I love the writing style if I'm honest yeah even yeah. though I think the world building is really good I agree I found the the inclusion of the hyper empathy that you spoke about just quite a weird Mm. extra feature that actually wasn't really necessary to the plot um because we could have understood the whole story without her having this crazy hyper empathy i suppose it's sort of what leads her in particular to be the one who establishes this new sort of religion and this this new world view but it felt a little inconsistent to me that she feels this hyper empathy sometimes basically when people are murdered she feels the same pain that they feel but yeah. at other times she seems to forget that she has hyper empathy i was thinking hmm i <laughs> felt like this should have been mentioned more if this feels like quite an important integral feature but yeah because it affects her so much it's like yeah how i think and realistically somebody with hyper empathy wouldn't really last past the age of five yeah <laughs> like, yes. in this kind of world so you are gonna have to because because she's so affected by it like she'll literally just pass out or um, I thought that was a strange addition to the book that wasn't necessary, maybe. Yeah. Um, that was the one thing I sort of struggled with is what is the relevance of the hyper empathy? Um, yeah, and it's not um, brought on by any kind of magical thing. It's like she she has it because her mum was an addict. So it was something to do with that mm. and like a user. So, so yeah, again, like, again like I was a bit confused by that. But there is a sequel. So maybe in the sequel they explain Mm. and the like, bigger significance of hyper empathy I'm always open to them, them being something well will you be reading the sequel are you oh god because I think probably not <laughs> but I enjoyed this yeah I enjoyed this both but I don't know if I'd want to read more about this particular world so I want to read the sequel but I, this accidental segue into something I was going to read out to you that I found <laughs> on Wikipedia which is obviously where the truth lies oh look at this Anton Deck pack it up where's the new double accent sound <laughs> I know <laughs> da, 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 da. let's go <laughs> Um, what do they used to do? That house, what was it called? In the house. Yeah. <laughs> Jack and Lena okay. in the house. <laughs> so yeah, the, the sequel's called The Parable of the Talents. Okay, so The Parable of the Talents won loads of awards. Okay, but she had a plan for four other novels. Parable of the Trickster, Parable of the Teacher, Parable of Chaos, and Parable of Clay. Um. However, after several failed attempts to begin The Parable of the Trickster, she decided to stop working on the series. In later interviews, Butler explained that the research and writing of the Parable novels had overwhelmed and depressed her, so she had shifted to composing something lightweight and fun instead. That Uh became her last book, Fledgling. So if the author was too stressed yes. and depressed yes. by writing the books, should I, a hopeful <laughs> climate person, <laughs> yeah, there's like a certain level where I'm like, if the creator of the world can't handle it. <laughs> yeah, can I? Am I strong enough? Can and I? I'm not sure if I am. Yeah. I mm. barely survived a little life, so I, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's telling. But I think it's a really great... It's a great standalone novel, so I don't think that that takes away from anything, and I think it's I agree. great as it is. Mm. I, that's, what, that's what I felt. I, 
I felt reading it that it worked very well as a standalone. So I was that's why I don't think I'm invested enough to maybe read a second instalment. I felt that once it ended, I was like, I'm satisfied with this as a piece of art yes. that I have consumed. <laughs> totally. And there is hope at the end as well. Again, we're not going to talk too many spoilers, but there is hope at the end. Yeah. And her aim is to create this community. And eventually, like at the very beginning of the book, she talks about how she thinks the destiny of humanity is to leave the planet. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Elon Musk vibes, but in, you know, hopefully yeah. a more socialist way. Yeah. Which so, is interesting. <laughs> maybe it's a bit closer to like 2022 than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> now all the billionaires are jetting off. It's like, oh, what do you know that we don't, <laughs> Octavia? <laughs> I know. Do you, have you read, I actually don't know, have you read a lot of science fiction before? Because this is kind of in that genre, but kind of not like. Yeah. Bits and bobs, not, not massive amounts, but I, I agree with you that there's that element of kind of we've destroyed this planet and we need to now look for another one to um, inhabit, which is sort of how a lot of sci-fi books begin. Mm. That's almost where this one feels it's going. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's almost like, it's like pre-sci-fi in a, in a way. It's like, this is like the apocalypse before the sci-fi kind of takes place. Yeah, um, in you're a weird right. Way, so. and, it's, and again, like, I don't really, from what I've read, I don't really feel like we're at that stage yet where we do need to just yeah. sack it off. And go. So, yeah. so in yeah, that way, I'm like, this one off, guys. <laughs> yeah, let's go. It's a it's a lost cause. Um, so in, in that way, like, I kind of think that it's a really useful um, thought exercise. But because the world that she predicted for 2024 does actually look a lot better, actually made me kind of very grateful for the world we do have. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I'm feeling like hopefully it will be more hopeful. I, I wonder if she was alive today, if she would write it in a different way. Questions we'll never know. Yeah. Well, there you go. We'll never be able to ask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have any like moments that stood out to you or anything that you, you're you like, okay, that's a part of the book that I'll never forget. I want to hear what's in your tabs. <laughs> well, yes. My, Get out so your tabs. My theory, my, my, uh, yeah, my theory behind reading is that you kind of have like two stories contained in one book. One is the story that is, you know, printed in black and white for you. And the other is kind of like the story of you actually reading it, which is why yes. I love like marking my copies. I'm such a a believer in dog earing the pages and underlining my favorite bits because I think that when someone then comes up to my bookshelf and they can take a book off yeah. instead of reading the blurb they can go through and read like my favorite bits which I think is really fun so I do that's why I'm a serial tabber and an underliner and a dog era and people get very annoyed at me for that because they're like you're ruining that beautiful book and I'm like yeah actually <laughs> We had a great time together. You wouldn't be like, oh, Jack, can't believe you're wearing that T-shirt. Like, oh, you're ruining it. Like, you're going to put holes in it by having fun in it. And it's like, oh, Jesus Christ, take a a holiday. Oh, yeah, my books books are in terrible condition and I wouldn't have them any other way. (laughs) Worse than somebody with a pristine book collection that's never read any of them. That's true. That's true. That's if you leave with nothing else today, it's destroy your books. (laughs) Yeah. Not in like a Fahrenheit four five one way though, like we like in a in a love your book so much that it gets destroyed way. <laughs> yeah. But um, I was gonna <laughs> read you this bit where they say, "Worship is no good without action. With action, it's only useful if it steadies you, focuses your efforts, eases your mind." And I thought that was interesting about how she is creating her own faith and her own religion. But she basically says, "It's all well and good to believe in something." But I want to believe in something that I feel is malleable and can shape not so the the belief I have will shape my life, but I will also shape the belief around what I'm experiencing. Mm. Um, it felt a lot more um, a, le- a lot less rigid, I think, than maybe some organized religion that we do encounter today feels. She sort of is at this point where the world is in such a state of destruction. She's had to resort to something new where like she can um, adapt to what, what she's actually currently experiencing and make sense of the world. Because that is what religion is for, really, isn't it? To mm. make sense of what's happening. Um, and so she talks about religion as change. Um, and it's something that kind of happens to the world, but also can be fixed in a way. Like she has hope that if something has changed to this state we can change it back out again. Um, And I thought that was quite nice. So I liked the idea of worship being an active thing that she was engaging in. I thought that summarised her kind of ideology quite well. Yeah, totally. And I guess it also means that it's less open to corruption because if if God is change, then you're allowed to just like incite change. Because I think a lot of like her community were just either hoping for things to go back to the way they were or Mm. they were just hoping for them to stay the same. And she was the person who was like, we need to leave the compound. This is not good. We need to... 
and everybody else is against it. So yeah, you're right. I think it is religion, but maybe not as we know it. Mm. But she says of God, like she kind of uses God as a way to explain the way that she understands religion to other people to kind of mm. essentially translate it into a into the terminology that we can understand for faith and religion. Yeah. Um, Cause she's done a lot of thinking about this. She really, she really is, uh, is deep in this earth seed thing, this doctrine that she's got. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she says it's, it's not a God. It's not a person or an intelligence or even a thing. It's just, I don't know, an idea. So it's mm-hmm. sort of this, this belief that, and, and so it, God and change are kind of interchangeable if you'll pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> There you go. You can have that one for free. But, but yeah, that, that interchangeability of those two terms for her is really important. And that's where she kind of separates her beliefs from traditional religion that we currently have today, I guess. Yeah, um, totally. So I thought it was interesting. An interesting way to see the world as being in a constant state of change and transit and flux. I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And I think also like this idea that like, like, religion isn't evil per se it's more what you do with it and she is yeah. not like i reject religion yeah she's more like i see your religion and i raise you <laughs> and i raise it <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly let's raise the bar um the quote that i pulled out is kind of like linked to yours a little bit interestingly yeah um so yes yeah, uh, this part says civilization is to groups what intelligence is to individuals it means it it's a means of combining the intelligence of many to achieve ongoing group adaptation. Civilization, like intelligence, may serve well, serve adequately, or fail to serve its adaptive function. When a civilization fails to serve, it must re um, it must disintegrate unless it is acted upon by an unifying internal or external forces i don't quite understand the last sentence that i've like copied out when i was like because this yeah. is stuff that i was like typing while i was listening yeah yeah um but i think and i think that's from earth seed and it like this idea that like civilization isn't just this ideal we have it is like in, like what intelligence is introduced was like we need it to make sense of us in groups like yeah. there's no other way and just because civilization has broken down doesn't mean that it's a bad it's a bad idea mm, yeah <laughs> Which was nice as well because I think like she's the she's the empath that yes. wants to like join everybody together, and everybody else is like the only way you survive is by cutting off other people's heads. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, oh, let's let's test that theory. Yeah, well, and that's it is hopeful in a way, isn't it? Because she's she's like, mm-hmm. okay, the civilization civilization has broken down, but I can see where we can go with it and what our next step is, and it's kind of forming these smaller kind of communes where we. I believe that change is possible um mm. and if the world changed to this point it can be changed to the next point yeah and so th- there was hope there which i think was important and it that uh, is facilitates the hope that we have at the end of the book mm. um which is pretty crucial i think yeah definitely do you think it scared you like because it kind of shook me but do you think it scared you in a way that was like it's it's scary because you're empathizing with the characters and then imagining that you're there or mm. do you think it scared you because like you've thought about that kind of world before and you're like oh does that feel a bit real too real to you do you know what i mean because i think for mm. me it was somewhere in between where i was like well we're safe it's fine it's 2024 it doesn't look <laughs> that familiar to me but then part yeah. of me was like oh this is just reminding me of other times where i've thought about the world ending and it really freaking me out yeah yeah i, I think i was more leaning towards like seeing it as a fiction um, in the sense of it did seem like several steps had been taken before we were like cutting each other's heads off to the, at this point. Yeah. Um, and the the desensitization to trauma that she has, you know, uh, without spo- too many spoilers, you know, family members have quite severe things happen to them. Mm. Um, and she sort of takes it in her stride. And although she's gutted, you know, it's part of her process of of continuing and finding this new tomorrow i suppose so and if anything it sort of actually sets her free from the community that she's stuck in by becoming sort of an independent person um i find that i found that a little weird because she was meant to be this crazy empath you know um and yeah she i was like "Mm, there's a lot of uh putting off your feelings i feel like we're bottling up here (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know. I mean, when, yeah, when you have this hyper empathy thing, like, how to what extent can you empathise with yourself? Like, yeah. you know what I mean, like, does it actually stop you from exactly from that? Because yeah, you're it, so I think it, it was the desensitisation to me to this this peril that I found was quite distant from 
where we're currently at with mm. you know the the climate crisis and it, it like you kind of said before it sort of is like we have the the scene that the book sets and the world building is very much like okay we're in this climate crisis and also the government is completely corrupt and people have gone a bit crazy and everyone's sort of fighting for themselves it's, it is really every man for himself in this book so it did feel quite far removed perhaps from what seems likely in the immediate future for you know 2024 to 2027 sort of time period yes definitely at, at least in like the US and yeah. I think like it's scary because like part of it like feels fantastical but then like the class structures within it are based on us yeah. <laughs> like they're like you know there's a lot of people that are just unseen in the book that obviously have either died or True. will and it's just unknown to the main character because she's just living her middle class mm. life that's like you know yes. she's got shoes she's a, she's like um a teacher so she's like teaching the other kids yeah she's one of the only literate people left so she's like teaching people um and stuff like that. Maybe it does come from an incredibly privileged point of view that this is so unimaginable. Mm. And maybe that's that's a comment as well, that the fact that we can't be... Maybe it's interesting that it is set in a very developed country like America to see that country um, be in this state where they've, they mm. don't have access to a lot of things that they take for granted currently. I think probably that is a, it was a conscious decision to set it in America. Yeah. Um, for sure, to, to envision what it would be like if it happened everywhere. We sort of assume, oh, if this is happening in America, it's probably happened everywhere else too. Us Brits, <laughs> we're probably in the same boat as Lauren here. <laughs> yeah, we're, not, we're going down with this ship, I think. Yeah, unfortunately. exactly. Um, yeah, no, I, I think as well, like, um, the kind of disaster relevant to it is always interesting to read about because part of me is like, Lena, this is your fun time. Why are you imagining, like, you know, all of your family, like, dying and, like, yeah. your house being burned down? Like, why is this yeah. a fun activity for you? But I think it's important because, one, it's good storytelling. Like, I'm yeah. I'm distracted from my own life by reading about it and it makes me think more deeply about my own life and there's loads of quotes in it that are good. But then also it is kind of like when I read um, The Road and stuff like that where it, it because we're surrounded by... Because in the society of capitalism, but like because we're surrounded by all this stuff that for makes you forget what's important and can suck yeah. you in, like sometimes you need to read stuff like that. That you, then then you can just have the next day where you're like, isn't it great that I've got clean water running through my tap? Isn't it great that I can have a shower before reading this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah sometimes it takes reading books like this to kind of pull my brain out of um, the capitalist cult. Do you know what I mean? A little bit and be like, oh, okay, like stop myself being as desensitized to it as as I mm. often am. Mm. but then it's also like hard because one of the questions that I'd written down was like oh would we recommend this to other people and I'm like it really depends on where you're at in your life because <laughs> yeah. I think you still do have to function in everyday life and to do that you can't constantly be thinking about the end of the world yeah I don't know if you have thoughts about whether you'd recommend it to people or or is it specific people you'd recommend it to yeah it's it's definitely not like the light-hearted beach read that you may be looking for for the summer. <laughs> um, but it Although is... there is romance, and I quite fancy the, the romance guy. Oh, I say. see. I had strong Monica and Richard vibes in that relationship. <laughs> okay, okay, I see it, I see it. But it's a, but this is a very niche. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. I I think that it's one of those books where I I think that collecting books is like collecting wine, where you kind of you you, you buy something that sounds really good, but you might save it for a time where it's going to be good for you to read and that you'll enjoy it the most. Ooh, so I think yeah. that I think this is a book to read when you want to kind of get in your head and and be a bit like, wow, I really appreciate the things that I take for granted every single day, like things like petrol or running water, electricity. Um, so like we said, it's a very harrowing book. It is incredibly mm. intense um, and overwhelming at times. Um, and sad to think of a world like this. But um, so I, I'm not saying I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm not necessarily going to be like, you know, make this your top priority for 2022, you know? Yeah, I think it, it does require basically a trigger warning for everything. None of which <laughs> yes. we've discussed here on purpose, yeah. but like, just think of anything that you'd require. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah, it's um, there. You'll find it. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So I think there is that element to it. But then also like talking to you and actually like when I was coming, going through my notes and all of the different quotes that I've written down, again, I don't have time to go through all of them now. Yeah. But um, 
like it made me think that actually this is a really good book club read because it has so many pullable quotes and like actually i i'm having a better time talking to you about the book than i did reading the book reading it i agree i agree that's not a bad thing no not at all i think yeah sometimes the it's the books that do um make you have a bit of a wider discussion about your own life um those are the ones that are actually really worth your time to read and um there's this wonderful quote by um Caleb Azuma Nelson where he says sometimes it's not about the book that you enjoyed sitting down and reading the most but it's the ones that kept pulling you back the ones that you kept Mm. thinking about and maybe that's one this is one of those books where in two years time I might not remember the fluffy romance that I really enjoyed last week but I will probably be able to say I read the parable of the sower yeah and guys tomorrow is 2024 and it's not looking good (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're like tiktok i think yeah as well like because it's like an older book i know that it has like influenced there's loads of contention about whether it actually qualifies as an afrofuturism book but i know it has like influenced that genre a lot Mm. and i i'm wondering like as i go more into my aspirational sci-fi phase yeah. It's coming. Mm-hmm. I, you can tell that I'm like bored of literary fiction at this point. I think it's becoming. We're really cutting it. Like lean. anything that is so completely different to literary fiction. Sign yeah, like, me please up. Get, <laughs> yeah. get me away from the character yeah. studies. Um, I'm wondering if if this is actually really good that I've read this because it's a seminal text for those writers. So I'm mm. wondering if I'll, in the same way that like I've read 1984 and then I spot it in other books a lot yes. of its yeah. influence. I wonder if mm. because of that, it's actually quite an interesting for for us book nerds. It's quite. Yeah. An interesting one to have to have read even though it's quite painful to read no i think that's i think that's a good point that there are there are certain books that you do just find cropping up everywhere and the influence of of, the influence of someone like jane austen charles dickens does really filter down into what we end up reading today it's really interesting to have read at least one of their works um and to Mm. to have dedicated the time to just doing a little bit of extra research than you maybe would normally do and just going into a little bit of extra detail because then you do end up, you're right, spotting its, you know, echoes of its influence every single, in every book that you end up reading. Yeah, um, definitely. I agree. I think that I, I think that this is probably a book that has inspired a, a new sort of subgenre, perhaps, of other stuff. Mm. And I think, like, I'm interested to read this book that she said that she went on to write. Apparently it's a vampire novel, Fledgling. I, I think I'd like to read her in her light-hearted mode (laughs) yeah i'm really interested in the rest of her writing because i think she's an incredible world builder and like some of the quotes she was coming out with as well i was just like oh there's another one i wanted to read out because i thought it was interesting Mm. i'm um this is um lauren speaking she says i'm trying to speak to write the truth i'm trying to be clear i'm not interested in being fancy or even original clarity and truth will be plenty if i can only achieve them and i was like oh that's such a good like that actually links to the whole theme theme of this series is because i feel like i have to be like I, like if I'm going to go into a climate conversation, I need to like cross all my T's, dot yeah. all my I's. I need to know what I'm talking about. Otherwise I'm going to make a fall out of myself and there's no point. Yeah. Whereas like for her, she's going into these conversations about her world that's already ending and like making people feel uncomfortable. But because she's like, it is urgent. <laughs> I'm not perfect. Yeah. Let's go <laughs> grab a bag. <laughs> We're leaving. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was interesting as well, this this kind of like idea that like you don't have to be perfect or fancy or even original. Yeah, well, firstly, I would say it is the most validating thing ever when someone else picks the same quote that you also underlined. It's like, yes, <gasps> a win. Did I? <laughs> I think we just literary criticism. I think we did it. I think we've, I think, I think that's we it. it. We've won. We can retire now. <laughs> um, yeah. Or we're both wrong together and have terrible tastes together and that's what fine a great too. company to be wrong with i'm that's happy fine. with that but also i on on your actual point that you made which was brilliant mm-hmm. i agree that i think it's important that she is a child because it means that we give her the the leeway and the we're quite we, we allow her the space to try and understand this world and the fact that she's kind of coming up with her own religion and she she's also coming of age i think is important that mm. she's she's given the um, the space to make mistakes and to to still be working things out, to still be ironing out all the details. And people do sort of question her on certain things and she has to think on her feet a little bit about what she actually means when she's telling people the thoughts that she's having in her head. She's trying to explain it to them and they do then say, yeah, but what about, what about this? And eventually she does sort of win them all over with her new uh, ideology. I think it's important that she is young, um, 
Yeah. Because really it just means that we're a bit more sympathetic to allowing her the space to discover and and perfect something rather than having to be the final the final finished product. She's like she's working it out. Yeah, totally. And also that that like this is a world that isn't like it's still got sexism, it's still got racism in it, and that she's like a yeah. black woman who's like, I will lead this new religion yes. slash cult slash idea based great idea. <laughs> Who can say? Yeah. I bet I I'm <laughs> assuming in the next book we find out whether it was actually a good idea or not. <laughs> yes, yes. But you're right, that's not like that's not without significance and stuff. Um do you have you read that many climate books in general? I think I've seen you pick up a few of them on your channel, but is it something that you are intentionally gravitating towards or like how are you feeling in general about your climate reading and is it something that you even think about as climate actually, reading? Actually no. Okay. Yeah, no and I re- and so I enjoyed this challenge almost i'm not so i'm a, a big advocate for kind of challenging yourself each year and i know that you are too with kind of trying to be like mm. i want to read things that are outside of my comfort zone otherwise i'll never learn more about the world and yeah um so yeah i always try and challenge myself to read more like kind of intersectional authors and diverse authors who i maybe don't come across um they're not the, the first book that you see when you walk into waterstones but they might be a few shelves back mm. um that's really important to me um, and reading things that have been translated into English is really important to me as well. So, yeah, I think that this is something that perhaps hasn't been my top priority, reading about the climate crisis. And maybe it should be a bit more. So when you suggested this, I was like, oh, my gosh, yes, I really want to do this because it's not something I've necessarily challenged myself to do previously. I mm-hmm. think if the if themes of sustainability and climate change have come up, it's been incidental rather than um, intentional from me. Um, so yeah, I was grateful to read something that was about those themes. So thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> no, well, it's perfect because I felt the same before I started the series because I always felt like I'd buy the books because I was like, yeah. I should have this book. I should have <laughs> yeah. the knowledge in my head. But actually reading it, I was like, oh, I'm not in the best frame of mind. Like I need to be in a perfect, like I need to set aside a whole weekend and take notes on everything. Yes. And actually just muddling my way through the books and reading them imperfectly and not remembering all the stats yeah. but at least coming away with a few top line ideas or or like more a bit yes. more knowledge and I feel like that's why um fiction felt like quite a nice way for me to start especially yeah. you know before going into something that was quite in, intense and, and fact-based and yeah. lots of statistics and empirical evidence it was nice to start at least with something that is fiction and you can sort of at least get a little bit lost in um Mm. and then have the kind of working out for yourself as well i think that's that's important too and thinking what is my relationship with the world that i inhabit um rather than just reading a bunch of kind of quite terrifying statistics so i definitely think those that's important too but um this was for me this was a nice starting point to then move on to some yeah. stuff that's a bit more kind of maybe immediately important to the world that I actually do inhabit, you know? Yeah. And I'm realising as well, like, th- like the people who are writing the books, they're the experts. You don't have to be an expert to consume what they're talking about. Do you know what I mean? So like, you can yeah. muddy all your way through. Like, the only reason the human race has survived this long is if we could be absolutely fudging it, like, half assing <laughs> everything, and somehow we've survived. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's not like... It's the same... And I think that's about, like, meat as well, when I was reading about these ideas and being like, actually, it's about impact. And, like, if everybody cuts out meat and dairy for breakfast we'd make a huge amount of impact it's not about Mm. a few people identifying as vegan and everybody else being sinners and i think it might be the same for reading i'm like let's all fudge it let's all read a little bit compare notes (laughs) like we can't we can't be just a few people who have read all the books and nobody else has read anything like do you know what i mean like it's just kind of like a healthy plate of food isn't it it's like shove a bit of climate fiction on there (laughs) it's good for you and and then if we all kind of uh coming to the table with the little bits that we've taken away from each book, even if we, whether we've read the same ones for a book club or different books, mm. to then each be able to kind of bring in a slightly nuanced perspective is makes us more powerful as a, a whole, I think. Speaking about power, my laptop is about to die. I'm, I'm growing the charger. <gasps> yeah, go, go, go. Chaos, it's here. <laughs> it's Don't worry, everyone. It's fine. We, before we're, we started well, we shooting, we had the conversation that we're, we're only as powerful as our technology allows us to be in this in this industry it's it's proving true on every level it's proving oh no Uh, guys adapters (laughs) oh god oh 
we're back. He's here. We're like, just as we're getting into the existential crisis, now we'll have just like a, a really a mini personal one as well. Yeah, just be like, oh God. Um, I think I want to end um, because this feels like a perfect way to end. But like, I wanted just because you're here and we have access to your, your incredible brain, you read a lot of books and you get around to a lot of books that sometimes you don't like, but you yeah. make your way through them. And that is something that like yeah. probably would have benefited my degree. It's probably why you came out with a way better degree than me. Um, do you have any tips for people who are like trying to get around to a book and like actually cu- like just they have a brain block and they're like, I actually can't. Like, is there any like tips or tricks or like hacks you can tell people about? My mindset is always that in order to be a better reader, sometimes re- g- getting through a book that I'm really not enjoying is is just as important as finishing one that I did really enjoy because I learned mm. so much about what I like. And for me, I, I always, if anyone says, oh, that, that book by XYZ, I hated that. And I always say, why? Like, what was the reason? Because mm. I think that it's very valid to, to not enjoy a book, but I... I always challenge myself to think, what what is it about the book that I didn't enjoy? Mm. And is that because the book is bad or because I didn't appreciate the book for... It, the audience wasn't... I was not the intended audience for this book, you know? Yeah. For example, I recently read Earthlings by Sayaka Murata, which is very... Oh my God, I've recently shocking. read that and yes. more trigger warnings for that. Yes. Than the, exactly. Like, Jesus Christ. There was stuff in there that I was like, I didn't even realise that I needed to be warned about this <laughs> coming up yeah. in a book. Exactly. I wouldn't have even searched for a trigger warning fact because I didn't <laughs> even know that it could be so shocking. Exactly. <laughs> and and I've seen reviews of that. I, I personally thought it was brilliant writing to be able to make me physically cringe at what, what I was reading. To have such a, a visceral response to a book is, is incredible. Um, but I've seen reviews where people are like this was too gory. I hated it, and I'm like, well, maybe that, maybe that, yeah, it, you, you picked up the wrong book for you, um, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad book, but it means a book, it's a book that you didn't enjoy, and that's also very valid. So I always try to challenge myself to think, why didn't I enjoy it, and who would, you know? Mm. So okay, I didn't personally like it, but who, who would, who do I know who would like this, you know? In people's defense, of Earthlings. It has a fluffy picture of a toy on the front. <laughs> it does, it does. It looks like the most approachable, adorable book ever, and it ends up being, like, borderline human centipede. And I don't... Yes. But maybe that's part of it as well. It's a piece of art. Yeah. That's what I'd, I'd be like. It was more like Tate Modern than Tate Britain. That's what I'd, I'd be like. It's there to Approach shock. with caution yeah. <laughs> with that book. Yeah. Um, Definitely. But, yeah, I always... Um, I don't know if... if you do this I think that you do um, is having multiple books on the go Mm. and so if I'm reading something like The Parable of the Sower which is so is so harrowing and is incredibly intense this is not the kind of book that I would sit and binge in one sitting it's not the kind of book that I won't sleep tonight because I I can't stop reading it because I needed to take breaks and to consider yeah holy shit that was a lot that was really intense yeah Um, so I like to have some other books on the go so while I was reading this I also read the Heartstopper graphic novel series which is just lovely and adorable and sweet and it's just and it's a real page turner and it's the kind of thing that is really bingeable so to me that kind of keeps the pace up a little bit so that when I consider reading there is always something that I can Mm. pick up there's always something I've got on the go that I for whatever mood I kind of am in a balanced diet. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, and then things like things like audiobooks do sometimes help you if you're struggling to get the tone of the book just right. I know that you said that um, you listen to this as an audiobook. Yeah. Um, which I think does help sometimes when you're struggling a bit with maybe like wanting to pick it up. Mm. Whereas I think I'm going to do the dishes, so I'll listen to my audiobook kind of thing. I yeah. think that's, um, that's sometimes how I read things that I'm not responding too well just on the page and this is a really good audiobook as well the person who reads it's really good and they do loads of different voices because there's loads of different characters sometimes having an audiobook really helps because the reader will identify the characters for you in their voice Mm. so you don't need to remember all the names yeah ideal ideal all the hacks all the <laughs> yes. time we kind of made a, an agreement at the beginning of filming that we weren't mentioning character names because we were like do you remember all of them because i don't <laughs> who can say it's like being it's like first day of work when you get introduced to everybody and you're like yeah no idea 
Yeah, I don't even so know my name now. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've forgotten who I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for being on, Jack. You've been absolutely incredible. Thank you for letting us pick your brains. Oh, thank um, you for having me. If you would like to join in the next episode, I've been a little bit organised and I've organised the next two episodes. So if you want to get ahead on your reading, next time we are reading This Is Vegan Propaganda with Melanie Murphy, which mm. is going to be incredible. And then after that, we're reading um, Climate Justice by Mary Robinson and we're reading that with Michelle Elman, otherwise known as scarred not scared um so if you want to join in and get geeky and read the books with us those are the ones you need to put on your tbr um jack where can people find you on the internet obviously most people have probably already found you but for the few <laughs> if there's a social media i will be on it and <laughs> it's just jack edwards or my second channel is jack in the books how have you got a name like jack edwards and you've got all of the urls <laughs> I don't. Oh my gosh, I had to have all my middle names and bits and bobs. And oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's that. Uh, it's the the kind of name where you just have to accept there will be an underscore or a dot or something, you know. Yeah, I suppose it's too late to rebrand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're a bit, I'm a bit far in like now. Really... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not Princess Consuela Banana Hammock or something. It's, uh, listen, I've been close at times uh, yeah. to that, but I, I've, <laughs> okay. I heard it was taken. <laughs> so. Um, well, yeah. in the book it said originality is dead. So you know. So. Jack Edwards <laughs> Jack Edwards is and with that I'm signing off as All Jack right. Edwards <laughs> thanks for watching Frog Snog out oh.